kick off. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all, wherever you are, and a very warm welcome from the Commonwealth Heritage Forum, which is organizing this series of talks on cemeteries of the Commonwealth. Uh, last week, we had a fascinating talk on the Jewish cemeteries of Jamaica. And this week, we shift from the Atlantic to the Pacific and a talk on two convict cemeteries in Australia. I, I say talk, but of course, in fact, we are lucky enough to have twin talks, two for the price of one, as it were. Um, Mary Evans uh, on, on the Norfolk Island Cemetery and then Caitlin Vertigan on the Port Arthur Cemetery, um, both talking about their, amongst other things, their individual characteristics and their conservation challenges. Um, so just quickly, a little plug for the Commonwealth Heritage Forum, um, which is, and it's the, the website, if you haven't found it, is commonwealthheritage.org. Um, and we're always delighted to welcome people as members. It's not a hu huge financial um, imposition, and there are lots of things going on. And the more support we can have across the Commonwealth, the happier we shall be. Um, uh, one or two m minor housekeeping things. Um, if it was a live talk, of course, I'd have to t give you means of escape advice in case of fire. But um, you probably know exactly what to do in your own places on that score. But please keep muted. You've been muted now. Keep muted until the end. And use the chat button for your questions, which I suggest we take after the second talk. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mary Evans. Um, um, and she, and uh, let me quickly find my... Um, and she's manager of Norfolk Island Museum which is located in Kingston and Arthur's Vale historic area, um, shortened to K-A-V-H-A. And she's a direct descendant of Bounty Mutineers. And she revealed that um, that was um, uh, John Adams and, and Fletcher Christian. Um, so she should know what she's talking about. And she gives weekly tours um, through the historic site. So Marie, I'd love to hand over to you. Thank you, Peregrine, and um, thanks for all those for joining in on the session. So, what are we, as we say in Norfolk? Uh, my name, of course, is Marie Evans, and I'm an eighth generation descendant of the Bounty Mutineers and their Polynesian foremothers. And I'm joining you today from Kingston, um, which in the Norfolk language is known as Donatone. Uh, and it's one of my favorite places. So I'm really excited to share with you our amazing cemetery and the history there. But before I jump into the dead end of town, I'll give you a little bit of context first. So I'm just gonna start sharing my screen now. So two seconds while I wrangle with technology. Excellent. And I hope that you can all see the presentation. Yay. Okay. So the Australian convict site. So Norfolk Island and Port Arthur are two of the 11 outstanding heritage places across Australia that make up the Australia. We're representative of the global phenomenon of the forced migration of convicts. And whilst there's over 300 convict sites within Australia, here are 11 of which, which make up the World Heritage is and just for context, Norfolk Island is that little blue pin located many miles out the coast of Australia and up from New Zealand. So we're quite remote and this has led to a lot of difficulties here on the island throughout its uh, interesting and checkered history. So in terms of our World Heritage listing, um, we've got the Darlington Probation Station, Cockatoo Island, Brickenden and Woolmers. We've got a horse here at CARVA, which is our fun and acronym, uh, which stands for Kingston and Arthur's Vale Historic Area. We have Cockatoo Island, Great North Road, uh, and Fremantle Prison, High Park Barracks, Old Government House and Domain within Parramatta. We've got, of course, Port Arthur that you'll hear from um, Dr. Kate soon about, and and also the Cascades Female Factory. 
Great. So there's a lot to see if you ever do make it down under. But in regards to Kingston, it's a really important part of the Serial World Heritage listing. Uh, and it contains over 40 standing buildings. Many today are homes, offices. Uh, we even have a golf club, museums, of course, uh, a church. And it's a real living site with a functioning port uh, and one of the best swimming uh, beaches in the Southern Hemisphere, plus, of course, an epic golf course that you can see in this map. Um, but the island's history here, oh sorry, just going back a screen. So with these images you can see Government House, which was uh, the foundations of which were constructed during the colonial settlement. You've got old military barracks, new military barracks with cannons perched outside it, the Commissariat store, which today houses our archaeological museum in the basement and is now converted into All Saints Church. We've got the ruins of the crank mill, which was a hand crank crank mill to further punish our poor convicts here. And what remains of the pentagonal jail. So there's quite a bit still left in the site. As for our amazing history here, we have a number of distinct settlements. We've got seafaring Polynesians that are here around 700 to 1,000 years ago. But Norfolk Island is one of these mystery islands in the Pacific in that our Polynesian settlers didn't stay. But we do have a lot of evidence for them being here on the island, which was a great surprise to Paul Philip Goodley King when he arrives to start the colonial settlement. Um, and this colonial settlement is established just six weeks after the arrival of the first fleet in at Botany Bay, based on, of course, Captain Cook's reports of the Norfolk pine growing here that he thought was suitable to be used as ship masts uh, and also the flax. However, they turned out to be not as good as what they were hoping for. The branches in the Norfolk pines grow right through into the centre of the trunk, meaning that these are weak and stress points within the timber and so they can snap underneath stress of rigging. While some of them are suitable to be used as ship masts, the vast majority of them were not, which was a disappointment to the British, but probably a good thing for us today, otherwise the entire island would have been completely cleared. Um, regrettably, the island, however, proved to be too remote and too expensive to maintain as a settlement, and it was closed. Her buildings were destroyed uh, at the, in 1814 to deter the French and the Spanish from having an easy foothold in the Pacific. And our cemetery that you can see here in this photograph taken by Kerry um, is located a part of the principal settlement area, then known as Sydney, which makes it really confusing for historians and anyone studying the island's history some 200 years later. Um, and when this closes down, there's an 11 year gap where the island is visited by the occasional whaling ship and rumoured to be a haven for pirates. In the penal British settlement, which runs from 1825 to 1855, it's reoccupied initially as a settlement for the worst felons and literally becomes a byword for perversity and punishment. And many of our convicts are just simply transferred from different penal stations. Uh, later, you'll get to hear about two poor men who endured time on the island and were later buried at the Isle of the Dead in Port Arthur. But during this time period, we had over 6,000 men transported to Norfolk Island for punishment. And thankfully, there's a bit of a reprieve with Captain Alexander McConaughey, who's allowed to trial a new and very experimental mark system here on the island. And that good behaviour could be rewarded for reductions in sentences holidays for good behaviour, even the ability for the convicts to have their own private farm plots and cultivate tobacco. So it was all right, but unfortunately, uh, Norfolk Island meant to be a place of punishment. You can't have convicts enjoying themselves and having holidays. So McConaughey is withdrawn. But it's worth noting that McConaughey's um, reforms are part of our judicial system today and are incredibly important. So when this notorious settlement has closed. The new inhabitants are the Pitcairn Islanders, which are descendants of the mutineers and the Polynesians, arriving in 1856 as we had outgrown our former home. And we arrived as an entire community, having journeyed for more than six weeks away from everything we ever knew. And today, when you visit the island, you'll hear the distinctive Norfolk language, which is a mixture of 18th century naval English, pre-French Tahitian, and old Creole, and also get a glimpse at this unique culture born from Britain's most infamous mutiny. 
We've also got another settlement here on the island. Well, we've got a few more, but just briefly, the Melanesian Mission, which operated up until the 1920s. And we had over a thousand Melanesians, those from Solomon Islands and from Vanuatu and other places, uh, brought here to be trained as missionaries. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more on their burial ground in just a minute. Uh, but just in regards to our little woven K logo, uh, it, for the Kingston site here, it references and represents the multi strands of our history here and also our island tradition of plaiting. So, our cemetery, this is where the fun starts. It's been in continual use through each of these settlements and is still used today. Uh, and quite likely one of the oldest in Australia still in use. It's located on the eastern side of the site, bordered by the golf course that you can see here behind my grandmother uh, and framed by the relentless sea and the breeze, which has of course shaped these magnificent trees bordering the cemetery. And it is a gazetted reserve within the historic site. Now, as you can see from this photo near the golf course, we're starting to run out of room. But never fear for me in the coming generations, the consecrated ground has been extended out um, and down towards the golf course and also down to the south. So that's reassuring. Um, and whilst the cemetery is the longest serving on the island, it is not the first burial ground on the island. And we've yet to find burials of our Polynesians, but I'm sure it's only a matter of time. But the first burying ground used during our colonial era was located on the picturesque beach you'll see down at the bottom of the screen, known as uh, Turtle Bay initially, and later become known as Emily Bay, uh, due to maps identifying Emily's grave located there. But from about 1796, the work out that it's probably not a great idea to be burying people on a tidal beach, and burials begin taking place instead on the eastern side of the settlement sign. And we've also found a possible early burial site um, near the colonial settlement area of Phillipsburg. You find all sorts of things when you go to dig in new telegraph poles. Um, worth mentioning also is our Melanesian mission, uh, which operated from the 1860s right up until 1920. And it had at least 120 deaths. And despite this photo with our impressive chapel in the background, which is the Bishop Patterson Memorial Chapel St Barnabas, which boasts the most beautiful stained glass window designed by William Morris of all people, um, burials actually occurred as per the Solomon Islander tradition across the stream near the chapel. And so these headstones have been placed as a memorial garden uh, up close to the church and for easy viewing of visitors. But today we know of more than 11 legible burials from the early colonial settlement, which operated from 1788 to 1814, many of whom were first fleeters or those who came up with the first fleet from England and arrived, uh, many of which arrived on the Sirius, which unfortunately wrecked here in 1790, stranding a number of people and bringing the population on the island to nearly 500 people, which was a lot of mouths to feed and starvation was a real possibility here. Uh, but the island became home not just to convicts, but also free settlers, marines and their families who were all later evicted from the island when she proved to be too remote and too expensive to operate. And they were relocated to New Norfolk, Norfolk Plains and Cascade, uh, which were named in honour of their time here on Norfolk in Van Diemen's Land, uh, later become known as Tasmania. And many of their descendants continue to visit the island uh, and our cemetery. And we've got a small collection of memorial plaques laid by our first fleeters. But here we've got John Owls, who was initially transported um, for sending in spring saws and files into a prison to help other prisoners escape. And rather amusingly, he later upon earning his ticket of leave becomes overseer of tools on the island and his, is one of the few gravestones that is carved in Latin. Here we've also got Thomas Heddington and who passes away in 1798 and one of our oldest legible headstones in the cemetery. Turning now to the penal settlement, um, the isolation of the island became an asset uh, for the British instead of a curse 11 years after the closure of the colonial settlement. And the island once again is reoccupied 
and set up on the principles of it being a great hulk or penitentiary to dispense justice to those transported um, and that justice was to be punishment short of death itself uh, going by the official records for the place so of course there are multiple uprisings, murders, escape attempts by our dear convicts here. Uh, one of the most notorious was the 1846 cooking pot riot that you can see this painting of here, uh, and which saw the murder of poor Stephen Smith, the cook at the cookhouse, whose grave is just in the middle here. And on his gravestone, it remarks that he's barbarously murdered by a body of prisoners. Now, uh, those who were, um, killed Stephen Smith and also three police constables uh, do meet justice and um, bush range, and they are buried in a mass grave known as Murderer's Mound outside of the consecrated ground of the cemetery, which you can see these two lovely fellows reclining on. Um, bush ranger William Westwood wrote just before his execution that my grave will be a haven, a resting place for me, William Westwood. The sweetest thought is what which takes away my living death. All will then be quiet and no tyrant will disturb my repose, I hope. So today it's only us tour guides who are disturbing him. But there are some really interesting features about burials from this time period. An officer recounts in 1848 that death is a universal leveller. All rank and condition, bound as well as free, are interned almost indiscriminately in the same enclosure. The aristocrat sleeps in death within a few yards from the felon fresh from the drop. There they are alike and trembling hope repose. And it's true. Uh, within our cemetery, we have no separation between Protestants and Catholics, uh, civil officers and their family, military and their family, convicts, and even executed convicts. Um, they're all buried in together. Um, and most wonderfully, some of our headstones do recount that they've been carved by a friend, but just included here is this wonderful headstone, uh, which is a joined headstone for two convicts who were executed uh, for their part in the notorious sheep gut murder, which is as nasty as what it sounds. And despite protesting their innocence, they were executed for this crime. And it does ask the reader to stop and meditate on this man's sad and untimely fate that before we pass this tablet by, ask, am I fit for eternity? So one of the unique features of our lovely cemetery here is that a number of the gravestones recount that they are carved for a friend um, and that they are often carved actually by the convicts themselves. Um, and they are carved to commemorate their friend's memory and sometimes their many virtues, such as this one by Lawrence Frayne um, for his friend William's story. And Lawrence Frayne is an interesting character because he's one of the few or the only convict to leave us a first hand account of life under Commandant Morrissey. And not just life, but also punishment, because it gets a bit lippy with the commandant to call him as great a tyrant as Nero ever was, and is suitably punished with a severe amount of floggings. Um, but it's not just our convicts carving these for their friends, the military also do so for some of their friends as well. And in terms of cause of death, um, these are also recounted on our headstones, which makes for some really interesting reading as you move throughout the site. And one of the most common causes of death is drowning, with boats frequently capsizing whilst trying to come ashore. We have no natural harbour here on the island, and of course, landing any vessel is a pretty treacherous practice. And here you can see um, two military men who were killed, one by accidental discharge of a gun, the other accidentally shot by a brother soldier. You can see here um, Private William Tandy, who um, is accidentally drowned whilst bathing in Emily Bay. And we've got poor Henry Knowles down here who was executed for his part of the mutiny um, in the 1834 uprising. We've also got Alfred Bulldog, the late chief constable of the island, who was not well liked by many um, and unfortunately drowned or fortunately for the convicts because he used to listen to the whispers of them and the military and then report all them steed straight to the commandant. 
we've also got Bart Kelly here. And as a young kid running around the cemetery, we love nothing more than finding the pirates' graves with the skull and crossbones on them. And technically, yes, pirates, um, because they were engaged in an uh, attempt of piracy and attempted to take the vessel, the Governor Philip, which was anchored at Cascade on the island at that time. Unsuccessful. Um, Kelly and a few others were killed whilst trying to take the vessel, but it's, it was very exciting as kids to see the skull and crossbones. And I do love with Kelly's that he's got this little clenched fist. There's this wonderful symbol of defiance, even in death with Kelly. And poor old Byron Adams, who's accidentally killed by a whale. Um, and what's unique about the site also is that this is one of the only currently known places within Australia to feature headstones actually carved uh, for our executed convicts within a site. So why do our executed convicts have headstones? Uh, Alexander McConaughey, our reformist commandant, writes that he said, I also authorise the placing of headstones or rather more commonly painted boards, none of which have survived uh, to respective graves, a privilege previously confined exclusively to the free. Our burying ground being a somewhat romantic spot apart from the settlement and near the sea, it was eventually seldom without one or more visitors reading and meditating on its stern and touching lessons and recollections. So oh, I've put these out of order. Um, in terms of notable characters, we have Tommy the banker, um, and he is initially transported when he's about 60 years old, and when he's 92 years young, they find him with three legal printing presses and over £8,000 worth of forged notes in his possession, including this lovely one here for the Ostilin Bank, which, when it came up to an auction house, sold for over $30,000, including the commissioner's fee. Um, and so he's an, an interesting fella. He's, of course, uh, at 92, then transported for 14 years here on Norfolk Island, and he almost makes them. But he's still having fun with us today, as the way that his gravestone is written, that's not the correct spelling of his name, supposedly. And apparently there's no such place as Frodringham in Yorkshire. He's 104 going by the hospital records when he dies. And every time we try and readjust his headstone, he always ends up on a lean. So he's still crooked even in death. We've also got a number of whalers and sojourners that have joined um, the community on Norfolk Island, including Frank Warren here. And more interesting for our visitors, uh, Commander George Hales um, of the ship, the General Boyd. And this, of course, gets a lot of attention due to the Freemasonic iconography on it. Uh, and to our knowledge, it is one of the earliest uses of this type of symbolism used on a gravestone within Australasia. So it's a pretty significant one. In terms of our types of burials, uh, we do have, of course, headstones, um, both for our military, their families, civil officers, and even our <laughs> dear executed convicts, uh, all carved from the local stone. Um, and we also have altar top false tombs or chest vaults, um, similar to those you'll find in burial grounds from the 1830s. Uh, and these are false tombs because the bodies are buried beneath the ground. But in 2017, we actually discovered a crypt underneath one of them, which um, was very exciting, although a little unsettling to see your first skeleton. Uh, and so poor Susanna Perry has been um, resealed up and given a little bit more dignity today. Um, we, a number of our headstones do have accompanying footstones. And of course, we've got those small memorial plaques for our first fleeters. Now, all of our graves do face east as per the tradition of facing burials for the rising sun, but also for the morning of the resurrection. This tradition, however, is not always the rule within the sites in Australia, as you'll soon see with Port Arthur's Isle of the Dead. But all of our markers here within the old section of the cemetery are carved from the local limestone, which was quarried for building materials when bricks were found to be unsuitable. And this activity during the penal settlement is constructed, is done by those on the chain gang. So pretty, pretty rough for them. 
1856, we've got the descendants of the mutineers from the bounty and their Polynesian partners arriving, and we have stayed. Now, the cemetery today, of course, is a very special part of our community, and I've got five generations of my family in the site. In these images, I've got the gravestones for George Hanot, um, who was the third outsider to arrive on Pitcairn Island and stay, and his wife, Sarah, who's one of the granddaughters of Fletch Christian. Um, Nobbs was later ordained as a minister in the Church of England and was instrumental in organising uh, Norfolk Island as the Pitcairners' new home. You can also see in this image down below, this is Dinah, who is the eldest daughter of John Adams of the Bounty. Uh, and on the left, we have got Isaac Christian, who is one of the chief magistrates on the island and lived in number 10 quality row, which today is our restored Georgian era house museum. Our headstones for the Pitcairn Islanders are a mixture of both local stone and today imported marble and occasionally ceramics. And we've got a great local sexton who takes very good care of the site and has even published a genealogical guide for us of the Pitcairners of Town Cemetery. And each year we commemorate the arrival of the Pitcairn Islanders as our bounty day, which includes a march to the cemetery in traditional clothes and plaited hats, where we lay wreaths and flowers at our family's graves. And as it's still an active burial site, uh, we have a number of modern traditions that we still uphold. Um, so traditionally the bells used to be tolled uh, from the churches to announce a death on the island, one year supposedly for each year of the person's life. Now today to make it easier, we use the radio to announce the death um, and occasionally we'll toll the church bells. All well, the flags around the island are lowered to half mast as um, um, respect for our families and also the individual and our sexton and volunteers hand dig the grave plot which is then covered and decorated by the family with flowers and foliage and it's really quite beautiful and when the hearse comes through town all the businesses shut their doors our kids are taught to stand still and um, remove their hats and all cars are to give way for the hearse coming down and as an additional sweet spot it's pretty much free to be buried here so it's a lovely spot to end up um, and our cemetery today is still a really key part of our community. The museums and other tour companies do tours throughout the historic site, um, including ghost tours, but it, of course is always open to visit and is lovingly cared for. In regards to conservation, as it's still used as a cemetery, the site is relatively well maintained uh, and as part of the duty of care to our older monuments, a new conservation management plan is currently under works. But we do have a number of challenges with it being located so close to the sea. But with this, it's 22 minutes, so I'd better um, give my thanks. Um, thank you so much for tuning in and letting me wax um, lovingly about our amazing site and we hope to one day see you here on the island. Marie, thank you very much indeed. It, it absolutely whets the appetite and um, as I'm sure Caitlin's talk will do too. And um, I've got lots of questions but I'm not going to ask them now. So I shall we press on with Dr. Caitlin Vertigan um, who is a conservation project officer at the Port Arthur Historic Sites Management Authority. And her primary role is in managing the complex interplay between natural and cultural values across the sites. So, Caitlin, over to you. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Let me do the magical screen sharing. And are we good? We're good. So I'll start, of course, by acknowledging the Paiderami people of the Paiderama Nation on whose land I'm currently presenting from um, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm just going to pick straight up from, from where Marie sort of basically stopped. I know we've got a you know, diverse audience and, and I'll do a little bit of, of putting Port Arthur in its historical kind of context and global context. Um, also, everything that I'm going to be talking about pretty much deserves a you know, presentation in its own right. So I'm going to be uh, taking a necessarily generalist approach to often what are quite nuanced and complicated um, topics, but you, know, you guys all, all know how that works anyway and, and throw any questions that you have at the end. 
So if we were to take a boat from Norfolk Island and travel for somewhere around three weeks, uh, you would get to the Tasman Peninsula. So it's, it's 2,700 kilometres. It is a big distance between our sites. And yet there was a lot of, of movement um, throughout all of the, the, the convict sites across the colonies. Uh, Port Arthur itself, which is in the southeastern part of Tasmania, was discovered by accident in 1827 by a man named Captain Welsh, who was sailing in his boat, the Opossum, across the fairly accurately named Storm Bay. And he hit a storm and, and, and went to seek shelter. So he sort of started climbing up. You can see that little uh, hook at the bottom here and discovered this incredibly uh, deep and safe natural harbour. It's actually one of the deepest in the Southern Hemisphere. I think it hits over 50 metres in some sections. What's that, 100, 150 odd feet? And he wrote uh, back and, and said it had everything that they needed. It was full of timber, uh, it had natural pastures, and of course that incredibly safe harbour. And he saw that little island uh, that was in the harbour and he named it Opossum Island after his ship, which I always thought was quite a nice name. Um, and then in 1830 was when the first boatload of, of convicts arrived. It was just 30 odd of them and they started cutting down the timber. By 1833, that population had risen to somewhere around 280 and it was now officially named a secondary punishment station. And by the 1840s, um, we sort of see it reach the peak of population, somewhere around three and a half thousand convicts. And uh, these pictures here are from uh, the 1860s and 1870s. So you can just see how, how quickly um, the settlement actually developed. And this is all that remains today after bushfires and 150 odd years of, of tourism. Now, in the early years, we know that um, the, the timber station years, particularly the 1830s work was quite difficult, uh, but the convicts were allowed to go fishing in order to supplement their diets and they were allowed to grow small pots of vegetables. Unknowingly, this was actually really good uh, for them because it was reducing things like scurvy. And of course, 1833, as Marie sort of already alluded to, they, they were uh, starting to tighten up on the rules and regulations and they, um, um, stop them from, from, they basically revoke those privileges. And at that point, we start to see the death rates kind of creep up, things like scurvy and dysentery. And obviously with the higher populations, there's a lot more um, transmission of, of disease. So Reverend Alan Manton was the guy who selected the island as the cemetery. And he writes that death and disease soon made inroads among us. So it was necessary that some suitable spot should be selected where to deposit the earthly remains of the departed. And he then describes the island and goes on to say, this, it appeared to me, would be a secure and undisturbed resting place where the departed convicts might lie together to await the morning of the resurrection. It was accordingly fixed on and named the Isle of the Dead. Now, he and others also uh, decided that unlike the Norfolk Island Cemetery, there would be separation here. So there is a low southern side of the island, and that was to be reserved for the convict burials. They were to be buried in unmarked graves with just a mound of earth to mark them. And then the high northern side, here's the convict burials. Um, and then the high northern side of the island would be reserved for the free and the military in often quite elaborately marked marked stones. Um, the convicts, I'll just sort of dispel a few myths because there's been quite a lot about the island over the years. The convicts here were not buried in marked graves. They were not buried standing up and they were not buried stacked three deep. We believe that they were buried in simple wooden coffins. Uh, there was a, a service read over them at the time of death and mourners were actually allowed to attend. Uh, and the island, unlike Norfolk, again, is not consecrated. And that was done intentionally so that everybody could be buried in, in the same area. We aren't certain how many people are buried in the cemetery. Um, we initially, you know, the numbers they, they think were much higher. That hasn't been backed up by stats. So in the 1990s, a woman named Lynette Ross did uh, some fabulous work on trawling through the records, but we know there are gaps. We believe that it's somewhere in the vicinity of between probably 700 to maximum 1,100 people buried on the island. So when it comes to causes of death, uh, we, we find that it splits out into almost three quite distinct periods. In the early years, uh, when we've got the timber station years, it is things like scurvy and, and dysentery. 
So mostly it's based around those nutritional deficiencies. In the later years, after 1867, um, Port Arthur essentially became a welfare settlement and the population started to age. And we see it all switching out to old age diseases. Um, it's heart attacks and strokes. And in the middle years, Port Arthur is at the peak of its industrialization and it flips out to uh, industrial accidents. So we've got crush injuries from falling logs. Uh, there are uh, uh, things like drownings, um, which is probably the most common cause of industrial death, and also respiratory illnesses from working and sleeping in damp conditions. And you can see that represented there by that histogram. Uh, the one on the right hand side sort of shows basically what a normal or what a population would look like now with that sort of peak occurring in the in the later years whereas in this histogram we have that very high rate of infant mortality which we would expect from the time uh, and then the death rates are pretty much evened out. Uh, do note though that a lot of the convicts were living well into their 80s which is not a bad one. So um, the, I wanted to point out um, Edward, Edward Spicer we know that the convicts weren't supposed to have memorials but like so many of these settlements um, despite the rules and regulations that were put in place we see that um, they get subverted almost almost straight away and and certainly um, this was happening with the convict graves lady jane franklin uh, visited the island in the 1830s and she commented that many of the convict memorials had wooden markers placed upon them and some of them had flowers marking the grave sites as well so people were caring about them um, right right from the year dot and uh, Edward Spicer, though, um, 1854, we know that the rules were officially relaxed and the first convict memorials start to appear. Mind you, for the sort of probably in excess of 700 convicts buried on the island, uh, there's nine convict memorials, somewhere in the vicinity of 186 free. Edward Spicer was born in England. He was married. He worked on the Southampton Mail Guard and uh, temptation got the better of this guy and he stole 17 pounds from the mail. Um, doesn't sound like a lot, it's about two and a half thousand pounds. I think if you, if you calculate it into today's money. And so he was convicted and he was actually sent to Norfolk Island and his behavior there was, was pretty good. And he was there though, arrived just before that cooking pot riot that Marie talked about before that culminated in the execution of a number of prisoners. But on Edward Spicer's record, it says to be recorded services performed at Norfolk Island on the present outbreak and to be sent to Van Diemen's land by a first opportunity. So nobody's exactly sure what he did. Um, we anticipate or we suspect that he probably assisted in perhaps subduing the riot, sided with the prison staff rather than the inmates, but it probably wouldn't have made him very popular. And he was uh, he was brought out to Van Diemen's Land, again, this perfect um, behaviour record, and so much so that they actually wrote and asked uh, for him to be given a ticket of leave for meritorious conduct, which was given to him, but he, by this point, was clearly suffering from some kind of illness, uh, and he died in the hospital at Port Arthur um, about nine months after receiving that ticket of leave, and without ever being able to return home. Who paid for it? We're not entirely sure. We suspect it was probably his wife who was still alive in Stratford at the time, but um, it's, it's not certain. Now, the geology of the island is something that people frequently comment on. You can see uh, from that bottom picture that it looks like it's quite rocky. It's made up of Permian mudstone, which is sort of somewhere between 250 to 300 million years old. And uh, it, it, it looks like it would be incredibly difficult to dig, but it's almost like a hard boiled egg. So you've got this outer shell of, of rock and then this um, inner center, which is made up of sandy topsoil. Um, so digging the graves was actually relatively, relatively straightforward. And of all of the jobs that you could get if you were a convict at Port Arthur, I'm thinking that the grave digger's job probably would have been the best one. Uh, Anthony Trollope, um, who was, quite the famous novelist. He visited this island in 1872. And he, I mean, he agreed. He said of all the modes of life into which a man might fall, surely his was the most wonderful. He was free to eat and sleep when he wished, might bathe uh, and catch fish or cultivate his little flower garden. And he quite famously made a comment to the grave digger at the time, a man called John Barron, that he, he should grow a few cabbages to which John Barron um, supposedly just shuddered and said he could never eat anything which grew from such soil. 
John Barron was replaced by one of what is most well-known convicts, a name by um, Mark Jeffrey, also known as Big Mark. His story was, was extraordinary and almost, um, it sort of typifies, I think, the, the, the convict experience. So he was transported for burglary. Um, he went through pretty much all of the British prisons. So he was at Chesterton and then to Melbank, and then he was at the Warrior, uh, the Warrior Hulk. Um, and that is where he attacked the second mate with a piece of wood in, in 1848, um, hitting him over the head. And that got him sent uh, to Pentonville to await transportation to Norfolk Island. Uh, and he was at Norfolk Island until its closure uh, in 1856, and then he was transferred to Port Arthur, and then we see him start basically 20 more years of constant recidivism. Um, in 1866, he was freed, uh, but you can see that he's walking on the two sticks, and that was because of ulceration on the legs, because of so much time spent in leg irons. And so he was returned to Port Arthur as an invalid. Uh, and after that, he was freed again, went back to Hobart, was in a pub brawl where he used those sticks, I believe, to attempt to murder somebody during that pub brawl. And at that time, he was sentenced back to Port Arthur for life. Uh, he was so sort of outraged at what he saw as injustice, his terrible temper, um, that he destroyed the inside of his cell and tried to murder the doctor who came to treat him. So they eventually sent him out to be the grave digger on the island because it was a way to keep him away from, from people. And he, he, um, he was out there sort of quite, quite happily. He would actually return to the main settlement to attend divine services on a Sunday. Uh, the way he left the island has gone down in, in sort of Port Arthur's history is one of the most bizarre incidents we have on record. They woke up one morning and saw that the signal fire had been lit on the island, signaling something was wrong. So they sent a boat out and found Mark Jeffrey waiting at the landing rock, begging to be removed from the island. And he said that during the previous night, he'd been woken from his um, slumber because the hut was shaking. And he said next, the entire hut was lit from within as though by an unearthly red glow. And then he received a visitation from his satanic majesty. Those are his words. Uh, he actually never again returned to the island and he spent the rest of his time at Port Arthur where he was much more subdued uh, than he had been. He was one of the last prisoners to leave when Port Arthur closed in 1877. He made his way um, up to Launceston where the book, A Burglar's Life, which is still in print, um, was, was ghostwritten and that sort of tells the story of his experiences. But ultimately he came back to Hobart and died a pauper, as so many of them did, and was buried in an unmarked pauper's grave somewhere in Hobart. And some other notable uh, convicts that we have uh, there were burials on the island were Henry Savory, who was Australia's first novelist. We have Dennis Collins, uh, who was quite well known for his um, incredibly, it was quite the crime, high treason he was sentenced for. He threw a stone at the king, which actually struck him in the head. Reverend George Eastman, who uh, was memorialised with one of these beautiful chest vaults, uh, essentially he was known as the good parson and for his ministering of all of the convicts. The other thing that sets our island apart, um, and, and one of the most exciting things that I think is on there, is a tidal benchmark that relates to this man, uh, Thomas Lempriere. If anyone at any point has uh, a, a couple of hours to go down a serious internet rabbit hole, um, jump, jump on and, and have a look at this guy. He was absolutely extraordinary. He was the commissariat officer at Port Arthur between 1833 and 1848. Um, so he was in charge of stores and finances. He wrote these extensive journals, which have been, as well as scientific papers, and they've been invaluable to provide us with um, information, not just on the sort of the regulatory environment that the prison was operating under, but also what it was like for the, for the people who were living it. Uh, he was a musician, he spoke multiple languages, and he was this avid amateur scientist. I mean, I'm, I don't know how he crammed so much into one day, but for somebody you know, living in Tasmania at the bottom end of the world, he was having active communications with people like William Swainson, Joseph Hooker, Francis Crozier, John Richardson, James Backhouse, and Captain James Clark Ross, um, who was of course the, the explorer. Captain Ross actually visited Tasmania and he was here to meet with the then governor, um, a man called Sir John Franklin. And the two had been talking about a lot of sort of various scientific exploits. And uh, Sir John Franklin actually mentioned that he knew Thomas Lampier just for his own 
amusement had been keeping very detailed records of sea level for a number of years. And when Captain Ross saw how detailed uh, the records were, he actually encouraged Thomas Lampriere to carve a tidal benchmark into the Isle of the Dead. Um, and that tidal benchmark was struck into the island in 1841. Now there was a plaque that actually went with it that said at what time the mark was struck. And that's obviously quite important if you want to use that for any um, comparisons. Uh, that though was, um, the mark sort of disappeared and, and is long gone. There's been a few expeditions to try and find it, but uh, we haven't been successful. But thankfully we do have some very intelligent scientists who work here. Uh, in Tasmania and they were able to kind of backdate the mark and in 2002 uh, Dr John Hunter and Dr David Pugh actually got the mark and they got Lempriere's records they installed a new tidal gauge at Port Arthur and they were ultimately able to use that tidal benchmark uh, to measure sea level rise um, due to global climate change in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, the Southern Hemisphere has been notoriously data poor. So that mark has been absolutely in, invaluable. Um, that is the IPCC Working Group 1. Um, for those of you who know you climate scientists, these are the rock stars of the climate science world. This was a very exciting day for me. Um, but uh, out of interest, the amount of rise that's happened since 2002 is about 13.4 centimetres, um, and that makes it to about 16 centimetres today. And we really are starting to see the impact of that on our coastlines. But um, ultimately, it, it is extraordinary that, that the incredible curiosity of, of one man in, in, 18, in the 1830s is, is still having measurable um, contributions to, to science today. So, as we said before, you know, the welfare years at Port Arthur start in the late 1860s and the population starts to age and eventually the whole prison was closed. Uh, that was in 1877 and the prison was, was, was left, left to the environment. Uh, Port Arthur itself became a township and a, a tourist site almost immediately and the trees grew up and, and the island sort of became fairly unkempt. Uh, in 1916, it was given over to something called the Scenery Preservation Board, and that's actually when we see the first tourists starting to pay to visit the island. I believe it was six, sixpence for a tour and a shilling for the ferry ride. Uh, and then control shifted to various municipal councils. And then the next big change to the island we see happened in 18, 1937, when a very well-meaning man um, decided that those who were buried on the island deserved some kind of fitting memorial. So he asked the government for a hundred uh, pounds, which he received in order to um, strip the island of all its trees and plant a beautiful garden, which would be full of, of English flowers and, and make it look the way it had that home but he, he just hadn't really properly considered that the second they removed all the trees from the island they exposed it to you know, howling southwesterly winds and northwesterly winds both cold and warm and it scoured um, half the garden out as well as scouring all the surfaces of the stones so in uh, it was only a year later that the chief horticulturalist at the department of agriculture said mm -mm, you need to re-sow the island and so they started to replant it and let the native trees grow up. But a lot of the damage had, had actually already been done by then. The other thing that contributed to the deterioration of the stones in that time is, as Marie said, the traditional orientation of, of graves in the cemeteries east to west, but at on the Isle of the Dead, the free and the military stones actually all face north. We're not entirely sure why that is. Uh, the best guess is that it's to face back towards uh, probably towards England and, and towards the place where, where everybody came from. Um, of all the trees that they cut down though, they left, oh, this is the island, sorry, after, after they stripped it, looks in, incredibly different. Uh, and those are upright posts with the stakes with which they were trying to keep the plants from falling over. <laughs> So they strip every tree except for one. I and mean, I'll just pop back because you can actually see it in that in that um, 1937 shot, which is here. This one eucalypt tree that remained that we first see uh, in an 1845 sketch by Catherine Mitchell. Uh, and then again, in the 1930s, that tree still remained and that tree is still on the island at the moment. So again, you know, not all the things that, that we can see uh, moving through are built 
fabric. Sometimes they are the natural features as well. So in the 1970s, uh, so you can see, you know, this is essentially you know, tourism really took off uh, and people were visiting the island quite frequently, but they were just traversing um, across the island with no real consideration for where they were going and people were walking right up amongst the headstones. And in the 1970s sort of and 80s, they established proper walking paths and, and platforms and chain fences to try and keep people away from the headstones. And that worked quite well, but in the sort of mid-2000s, um, we realised there were a couple of problems with that, largely that the paths were being established using sight lines and um, a lot of the walking paths were headed straight through the centre of the convict burials. Uh, and there were also issues with those platforms not being particularly accessible. So uh, in the mid, um, so we just completed uh, what was a major project on the island to replace all the walkways uh, with essentially what's a floating surface. Uh, the footprint of these um, on the ground here is actually very low. They're just little concrete foot pads and, and um, that sort of reduces the pressure onto the island. And um, it enables us to kind of, you know, our future conservation work will, will focus predominantly on maintaining those headstones and uh, replacing all the senescent plantings that are at the perimeter um, in order to kind of continue those best practice conservation standards. So that is a very flying overview of, of the island. Um, I, 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 it still astounds me, you know, these convicts who were transported across the world and not for a single second thinking that we would still be telling their stories you know, 200 odd years later or that people would still be interested in them. But thank you and question time. <laughs> thank you so much, Kate. And once again, I mean, it does make one want to jump on a plane if we're allowed to, or probably ought to be going by, go by boat. It would take a very long time. But, but that was fascinating. I'm, I, I'm sure I can't see any questions yet in the, in the in the chat, but please raise your hands if you would like to speak, ask a question. Um, and if I could kick off with one um, to both of you, really, um, Mary, you you bought some convict graves that were were outside the consecrated area, but then said that they were they were um, part, buried adjacent to each other. Um, and was that after McConaughey? Um, and it was it eventually McConaughey's view that came to to um, Port Arthur. Oh, that's a bit of a tricky one. So um, our murderer's mound or the mass grave used for those involved in the cooking pot uprising was located in an old saw pit outside of the consecrated ground of the cemetery. Uh, ordinary convict burials occurred within the cemetery grounds, um, and we have headstones for executed convicts that predate McConaughey's orders. So it's an interesting one that we're trying to track back through the records at the moment and establish when this practice actually was allowed to be started, because um, obviously it takes a considerable amount of time to carve a headstone uh, for a friend. Uh, and it's a lot of the time when reading the inscriptions on it, they are very clearly a warning um, to other convicts um, and is very clearly marked that they're executed. Um, although the Catholics and indeed the, the Irish Catholics seem to have the most decorated and the best headstones out of the lot. So they clearly had very caring friends. <laughs> um, and actually just quickly on that one, in terms of denominations, um, every, every Christian denomination, any, any Jewish burials, uh, not, maybe even have been Jewish convicts, I don't know, or, or other faiths? Uh, yes, we definitely have um, a few Jewish people within the cemetery, and one of our local artists has actually done uh, a series of stamps um, of beautiful watercolours um, of the Jewish burials within the Norfolk Island Cemetery. So I think you can find those, the easiest way would be on eBay these days. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're the same. Um, we have a sort of a, a, a reasonable, um, the majority were Catholic and Protestant. Uh, and it was interesting because, again, Pole Island's unconsecrated. Um, they were supposed to be no um, sort of 
no concession given to that. But uh, in John Barron's um, files, we know that he was keeping two graves dug at one at any one time, one for a Catholic and one for a Protestant. And he was actually getting in trouble for that um, because I mean, there was no point to it, but he was still doing it. Uh, but we also know that there are some Jewish convicts uh, buried out there and yeah, at, at least probably two Indigenous Tasmanians as well. Right, interesting. Um, um, I, I don't want to hog, hog the things. I'm, I'm very keeping an eye very keenly open to any hands right raising. Um, but um, and, uh, Megan, you can tell me if I'm missing anyone. But but in, in term, conservation terms, obviously, sea level rise um, with climate change is, is a real concern in any island state, as we know. And, and um, clearly, as you were pointing out, um, uh, Norfolk Island Cemetery is very vulnerable. Um, have, have you been looking at um, um, reme some kind of re re remedial action to take um, in advance of, it, of that happening? Uh, we're looking into it at the moment, but um, currently we're strengthening our seawall uh, located close to the cemetery site. Um, it did part of it did collapse in the 1970s, and we recovered a or part of the skeletons of <laughs> one of the men buried within that mass grave of murderers mound. Um, but there is still a, a lot of work and a lot of concern because of the the coming changes and how do you protect a site that is close to sea level. Uh, the rest of the island generally sits above a 90 metre contour line. Uh, so the historic site contains quite a bit of land, but it's all on the lowest area of the island. Mm. So it, mm. it is of concern um, and it does suffer when we do have a lot of rain and it can flood the site. Yeah. I can, yeah, I mean, I, I can see it being a real, a, a, well, a real issue and po possibly less so um, in Port Arthur? Uh, yeah, yes and no. Um, permanent inundation, probably not too much of a problem there, but the increase in sea level rise, because the Permian mudstone is particularly soft, uh, it, it means that we're getting an undermining of the cliff faces. And once that front face goes, um, then you know the, the whole thing can be exposed. We've got other areas that are of much higher concern when it comes to sort of impact of climate change. But um, the other issue that you've got then is increased ocean acidification, which for things in any kind of limestone uh, is absolutely disastrous. So it will, will increase the rate at which any of your, your stone fabric decays. Absolutely, but I mean, I was I was surprised by by the gravestones um, in Norfolk Island. How compared to a lot of English graveyards of, of equivalent date, how how very sharp the carving still appears to be. And I was thinking that presumably no frost is a help. Um, but you were saying, Caitlin, that there was, on the other hand, serious yeah um, degradation of. of of stones in in uh, so different different climate conditions, I guess. Com completely different climate conditions. So we have um, you know a temperature range here from probably minus five up to somewhere in excess of thirty five to forty degrees um, Celsius. So uh, we have sub freezing and and very warm and very high winds as well. Plus our sandstones are notorious for being very soft, whereas Marie, your conditions. Um, no frost. We sit at a beautiful subtropic temperate area um, and our limestone, our calcarinite, um, is quite hard. It does carve easily, which made it useful for the headstones uh, and thankfully formed in two useful ways for the British. So we've got rubble calcarinite or coral rock because it breaks evenly along bedding planes, enabling them to cut it easily, transport it and then stack it up and use it much like bricks. Uh, and then we have massive calcarinite. So the entire coastline from Cemetery Bay around to Emily Bay and also to the eastern side of one of our outer islands, uh, Nepean Island, was quarried uh, for use of the limestone uh, for buildings and headstones, of course. <laughs> Fascinating. Thank you very much. So um, would anyone else like to ask questions before we wrap up what I found an absolutely fascinating session. Answer came there, none. Well, 
I'm, I'm sure, I mean, I, I think it was a, a completely absorbing and a fascinating subject. And I don't think I've got any relations there, but who knows? Um, <laughs> we might, might try and find out. But thank you very much, uh, Caitlin and Marie, um, for, for, for a really enjoyable and interesting evening. And um, I'm, I, uh, we'll, we'll put the, the recording of this up on the, on the uh, CHF site um, as soon as possible. And then anyone attending who thinks there might be others who'll be interested, and I've certainly got a few friends who'll be interested, we can send it round to them. And um, thank you very much indeed. And hope one day we might meet. Here thank you so yeah, hopefully so. Thank you so much for having us. It was a real pleasure to share our amazing sites with you all. Um, both Caitlin and I are really quite passionate about it, so it's exciting to be able to, to spread the word about some of our really unique features of them. And we hope one day to see you down here in our part of the world. Thank you. We'll try. Thank you. Thank Bye you. All. Thank you, everyone, for Bye. attending. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.